things that are occurring, occurring in analytics is taking information that we're gathering, the behavioral information, uh, the visitor journey on the website, whether or not someone clicked on link A or link B in the email that we just sent out, and taking that, consolidating that into a single view of the customer and leveraging that to drive things like personalization. Personalization that may occur within marketing automation systems or may occur within your website uh, through the CMS. So again, analytics, uh, much like some of the other platforms, uh, have has its tentacles in a variety of different platforms to get a consolidated view of what's going on. And with that, again, uh, much like CMS uh, in other areas, CMS is, in many cases now also include some form of analytics. Uh, so again, we need to weigh our need for a dedicated analytics solution versus what may come uh, with our CMS platform. In addition to some of these common platforms that we're using, these categories of platforms that we're used to, there's a few purpose-driven solutions that we might look at. One, of course, is customer relationship management, CRM, um, is now becoming a very common point of integration with the rest of the system, particularly now as people are looking toward marketing automation as uh, a big part of how they engage with the customer and, of course, dealing with the email channel. Um, digital asset management, depending on what industry you're in, may be very important. If you deal a lot with products, uh, perhaps you're in the retail space, um, that might be highly important to you to make sure the images and uh, other information for those products is stored uh, with easy access. And then, of course, e-commerce. Uh, and e-commerce can go hand in hand with some of these other systems. Uh, and e-commerce systems themselves may include things like email automation and CRM and a variety of other things that, again, we need to weigh against some of the standalone solutions. Uh, as we go into some of the what we call kind of hot platforms that are currently out, um, marketing automation being one, it's finally coming into its own over the last year or so. There's uh, a variety of vendors to choose from now, uh, and we're going to hopefully see some maturation in that market, and then with that, obviously, the need for differentiation of these vendors and uh, new new functionality coming up. Communities, online communities, also something that uh, is becoming more commonplace. Uh, people have partner pro portals, they have recruitment portals, a variety of mechanisms to help enable their business to reach certain goals. Uh, and the online community is becoming a fundamental part of having allowing them to do that. Um, something just coming in is getting a lot more discussion and people are not sure exactly where it fits. Um, something different than communities is around the social media. Uh, things like HubSpot and Buzzio, uh, where we're actually able to now um, kind of grow external community engagement. Uh, as well as linking it back to our private online communities. Uh, so there's a lot of moving parts here, uh, and the dust has to settle in a few of these areas, but we're, we're seeing some emerging opportunities for, for marketing organizations to take advantage of these. So with that said, you know, what we find is that if you're a marketer, or even if you're a company at large looking to solve some problems, whether that be uh, how to grow uh, the lead flow, uh, how to achieve conversion uh, of leads in a shorter period of time. Maybe it's retention of customers uh, over a longer period of time, customer service, whatever that may be. Um, the digital platform is about being able to engage with people across multiple channels in a unified manner. Uh, and because there may be so many different platforms, the process of selecting it uh, can be difficult. So what makes it difficult? Well, first of all, marketers like yourself are uh, becoming increasingly sophisticated, and your expectations for these platforms are increasing uh, very rapidly. Uh, you do a lot of reading. Uh, you read about best practices. You understand what's possible. Uh, and the world is your oyster if you only have the right tools in place. Uh, and so we're finding that marketers do drive a lot of what we're finding out there. Um, we realize CMS doesn't do it all. 
So we're going to have to look at additional platforms. Uh, with that, we've got commoditization in the market. We see prolifer proliferation of other platforms, the overlap that we discussed. Uh, there's a lot of unproven vendors and emerging, emerging technologies. And with all of that said, you know, things really are moving very quickly. Every year, uh, we can see the trends change. This is the year of marketing automation. This is the year of social media. This is the year of mobile. So we see a lot of things change and people adopting things very quickly. So with that said, you know, marketers are the primary driver for a lot of this change. They're the ones that often innovate around uh, some of the goals that they have and are driving uh, new types of technology. Uh, and with that, we're finding <clears throat> that, you know, thinking about your CMS and where we started from, uh, many marketers originally were looking at the CMS and adding to it as the fundamental platform in which they can bolt on additional functionality. They often look at vendors uh, that have claimed to have a full suite of functionality, and perhaps they do, uh, but we also need to take into consideration that those suites built around uh, a CMS may not be or may not have the depth and control that we're looking for. In addition, as we mentioned before, a lot of commoditization. There's a lot to choose from, and there is a lot of overlap. All of this contributing to the complexity involved in making a digital platform decisions. So let's start talking more about how we get to the point where we select the, select the product, select the vendors, um, the platform categories that we want to identify, and then what, what's the road to success? Uh, what are the steps that we've taken and we've found successful in uh, many engagements that we've had uh, to help organizations find platforms that align or are best fit for their needs? So some key things or principles that we always uh, communicate to our customers. One is educate yourself. Don't rely on us to educate you. Go ahead and spend some time on your own. There are plenty of great resources out there. Look at needs, not features. It's very easy to be caught up in the features and the demos, uh, but it's really about what you need and how the, cust uh, how the platform supports those needs. I always say every car has four wheels, steering wheel, doors, engine, but it's really until you take the car out for a test drive, look under the hood, read the consumer's reports, only then will you get a better understanding if that car is going to work for you. Look at solutions, holistically, opposed to products. See how things fit together, and we'll talk about that some more in a moment. Um, set the team up for success, and that's very important. Identify the key stakeholders. Get people involved. Um, follow a process. There are a lot of processes that work. We have one that we use internally, but other organizations have as well. But it's a, it's a matter of getting the check boxes that you know they're part of the due diligence process. And then define a roadmap. How are you going to take this process from beginning to end and what's going to happen afterwards? And then finally, vendor stability. Um, we see a lot of vendors being purchased, some vendors going out of business. Uh, so it's always good to have a clear understanding of what the roadmap of the vendor is. So in terms of educating yourself, there's obviously a lot of uh, solutions out there. Uh, there are people you can talk to. Go to users groups. Go online. Do your research. Uh, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, speak with the vendors themselves and have them provide you with analyst reports. They're looking to sell you something. They can provide you with information as well. The um, the other part is really involving the team. A lot of not selection processes fail, but really what happens after selection. The whole once the product is selected. You know, you may find out that not everyone has been bought in. Not everyone had a chance to have their say. And this is where a lot of organizations fall into problems. So getting the team set out, uh, set up correctly, get that broad set of stakeholders really is about laying that foundation for success. Uh, focusing on um, this is a marketing initiative, making sure that there's clear owners uh, and that there's clear sign-off processes, that people have had their voice 
and has had a chance to sign off and, or disagree. Uh, and then, uh, you know, don't be afraid to bring in the consultant. If you don't feel you need them for the entire engagement, use them wisely where you think you might need them. Uh, if they've done this before, uh, there's great value in providing third-party perspective and also providing third party to facilitate the engagement with internal stakeholders. The other thing is follow a process. And I said before, we ourselves follow a process that we've developed over the years and have refined and matured. Uh, but there's a lot of processes out there that work. And you may look at a variety, but make sure that they address some of the due diligence areas, due diligence areas that we need to look at. Our process really is around four steps. Um, within each step, there's a lot of uh, various tasks that we go through uh, to both capture information and process that information, get people to respond to it and understand it, and then finally use that to filter uh, the various vendors that we've identified. Uh, we want to look at things from a holistic perspective, and again, focusing on that stakeholder input. We really believe that is key to success, not only during the selection, but again, once a selection is made, uh, you don't want people standing up and kind of uh, raining on your parade by saying, hey, I was not involved in that decision. So this is a great time to get everyone involved, get everyone on the same page, and uh, provide proper education. So our selection process, as we just said, really boils down to kind of discovery, analysis, an investigation phase, and finally, a selection phase. You know, in the uh, discovery phase, uh, what we find is that we, this is where we actually prepare for the rest of the phases. Uh, we identify the various stakeholders. We work with the lines of business within the organization. Uh, we begin to, you know, define the vision for the project, identify clear objectives through project charters, um, you know, talk about internal use cases or scenarios, how people are going to be using the system, how they want the visitors and your customers to engage with the system. Define the stories around that. Very important tool to define stories because it helps drive things like demos and proof of concept much better than just pure feature lists, which tend to not focus on how it's done, but kind of tell you, oh, they've got a door, they've got a wheel. So does everyone else. So looking at the stories and the personas is an important part of this. The analysis phase, uh, we take a lot of what we've now uh, put together in the discovery phase, uh, and we start looking at what we've collected, common requirements, see if we've got duplicates. We have some internal negotiation with stakeholders on the meaning of some of these requirements. Uh, we begin to prioritize things and refine the stories and use cases that we've developed. And finally, we're able to develop um, the requirements document, the persona document. And these are tools that we will then use to develop other things like the RFI and the demo scripts, and perhaps a proof of concept document that we will ask vendors to participate in. So in the investigation phase, uh, we now take all these refinements that we have around the requirements and the use cases, uh, and we begin to think about, OK, What's the universe of vendors out there uh, in the various platform categories, uh, CMS, marketing automation, search, maybe it's e -com, that would address, in general, the problems that we have written down, the requirements that we have. Uh, then we begin to identify what's called uh, must-meet requirements. These are things that people within the organization, stakeholders, say, hey, I can't live without that. If the product doesn't support that, we can't, we're not going to look at it. So it, by defining that, we quickly narrow down the list from maybe 10 or 15 vendors in a certain category, perhaps down to five, six, or seven vendors in a category. Uh, then we start looking at uh, you know, demonstration criteria, what we might want to see in a demo, proof of concept if we're interested in that. Uh, and then all of this begins to come together eventually to also define our RFI, which we send out and allows us to have another filter to call out vendors that don't meet our requirements. So we engage with the vendors. We let them know what's coming. Um, you know, we send out the RFIs. We get the response. 